looking at the oracles against the nations. And as we said at the outset, it uh, divides rather neatly into uh, 97 verses and 97 verses. Now, it depends a little bit on how you count and whether you're using Hebrew or Greek. But the second 97 verses are all devoted to Egypt. The first 97, a large section of them were devoted to Tyre. These two great nations, uh, uh, Ben was making derogatory comments about my map skills. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tyre up here, Egypt here, and Judah in between. So that in both these cases, we're looking at possible reasons why, on the one hand, they might turn to these nations in trust. Babylon is oppressing them. Babylon has, we've seen before, this three-step approach. The first approach and a surrender. The second approach, a revolt and surrender. And the third, revolt and destruction. So, three strikes and you're out, yes. <laughs> this is in 605, Nebuchadnezzar showed up, having defeated the Egyptians, up at Carchemish, up almost at the top edge of the uh, board there, and demands their surrender, and they do it. Jehoiakim was the king at this time. He had been a vassal of Egypt, but he changes horses. Then, in about 601, Jehoiakim revolted against Babylon, and in 598, he had died. We don't know exactly why. And his son very wisely surrendered. Now, in 588, Zedekiah at the instigation of the Egyptians has revolted against the Babylonians. Jeremiah makes a great deal of the fact that Zedekiah had made a covenant with Nebuchadnezzar. Now these covenants are sealed by your God. So in God's name, in Yahweh's name, Zedekiah had made a promise to Babylon. Now he's broken it. And so it's in that situation, then, that all of this is going on. As you noted in the introduction, these two chapters, chapter 31, is dated during the exile. In the summer of 587, and... Chapter 32, excuse me, during the siege, I'm sorry, during the siege of Jerusalem, 587, and now in chapter 32, it's 585, after the siege has been successful and Jerusalem is now destroyed. So that's the pattern that's going on here, and basically, as we've seen, the 
oracles against the nations, on the one hand, are, as, as I've just said, false trust. These nations that you might trust to deliver you from Nebuchadnezzar in this last hour. No. But also, nations which think to profit from Judah's fall. And God says, don't expect that. Especially, that is, was to the neighboring nations, uh, Ammon, over here, Moab, Edom, the Philistines. Don't you guys expect that you're going to profit from Judah's fall? This is happening because I brought Nebuchadnezzar here. And it's not going to be for your benefit in all of this. So those two reasons really are in the uh, oracles against the nations. And these two that we're looking at tonight are particularly the former one. Uh, you think Egypt's going to help you out now? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Okay. Chapter 31 is interesting because basically it is saying, remember how great Assyria was? And what has happened to Assyria? So Egypt, do you think you're going to be any better than that? Now remember, Assyria had been the major player on the world scene for about 300 years from roughly 920 until 620, Assyria had been the dominant player. They're the one you had to come to terms with. The Roman Empire was not much longer than this. The British Empire was not this long. So here is the dominant force in the world for 300 years. So what happened? What happened? As I said, the high point of the Assyrian Empire was 650, when they finally, after all those years, captured Egypt. Twenty-five years later. The first of the great capital cities fell. Twenty-five years from the high point to collapse. And then the other cities fell, Nineveh and Kala. And the emperor then in 60, excuse me, 610, we don't, even, we don't even remember his name. We don't pay much attention to his name because he's a nobody. He flees. The Euphrates, the Tigris, the Assyrian homeland was there, and the army fled west to Haran. The Egyptian pharaoh came up there, apparently to help them, hoping to keep a weak Assyria between himself and the Babylonians. And 
Basically, it was a standoff. The Babylonians didn't really win, but on the other hand, the Assyrians and the Egyptians had to have a victory and they didn't get it. So, for the next four years, Egypt is trying to prop up the remnants of the Assyrians. And finally, in 605, at Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar wipes out the last remnants of the Assyrians and defeats the Egyptians. It's over. So again, I say, it's, it, in, in my thinking, it's rather like the collapse of the Soviet Union. Who, in 1980, would have predicted that within nine years, the Soviet Union would have collapsed? But there it is. This collapse took a little longer, but not much. Basically, 20 years. Okay, with that as the background, look now at this poem. He's talking to, who can be compared to you Egyptians in majesty? Consider Assyria, once a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches overshadowing the forest. It towered on high, its top above the thick foliage. The waters nourished it. Deep springs made it grow tall. Their streams flowed all around its base and sent their channels to all the trees of the field. So it towered higher than all the trees of the field. Its boughs increased, its branches grew long, spreading because of abundant water. All the birds of the sky nested in its boughs. All the angels of the wild gave birth under its branches. All the great nations lived in its shade. It was majestic in beauty with its spreading boughs for its roots went down to abundant waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, nor could the junipers equal its boughs, nor could the plane trees compare with its branches. No tree in the garden of God could match its beauty. I made it beautiful with abundant branches, the envy of all the trees of Eden in the garden of God. Now, why do you think God inspires Ezekiel with a poem like that. Why not just say, hey, Assyria was the greatest of all the empires, and you Egyptians are going to compare yourselves to that? Why not just say that? Why this lovely poem? He's emphasizing that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yes, yes. What other thoughts? Isn't Babylon, Babylon known for its gardens? Well, but this is Assyria. This is not Babylon. I think that poetic language is going to make a statement far stronger and stay with it. It's also from a creative God. It's so close to what he gives Daniel in the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. The, the purpose of poetry is affective. It's to create feelings. It's to create impressions, visions. And so, much more powerfully than merely a simple cognitive statement, it makes that impact. Now, what are some of the things that are said about Assyria here? What, what are some of the things that are being said about Assyria in this poem? What, what pictures, what visions? It's very dominant over everything. Okay, dominant over everything. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful, yes, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The glory, the glory of a great conquering nation. Mm-hmm. What else? Well, it's 
It all came from God. Yes, yes. Verse 9, I made it beautiful. I, I want to talk more about that uh, before we're done this evening. But that's a key point. And look at that ninth verse. Where is it? It's in the garden of God, which is what? Eden. Eden. Hmm. This great nation is part of God's world that he has made beautiful, that he has endowed with life and beauty and glory. And if it has life and beauty and glory, it has it because God gave it to him. Look also at verse 6. What's it saying? It's a blessing. And what else? Shelter. Shelter. It's home. All of the nations are looking to this great nation for their own position, for their own power, for their own place. It's all fitting together. And again, it's God's plan. Now, let's pursue that. When we look at world history, what lesson are we supposed to be drawing here? <laughs> yeah, well, what's the answer? <laughs> That it is <clears throat> we tend to look, and certainly the Assyrians looked at their own power. When you read the Assyrian annals, <laughs> these guys are the greatest things since sliced bread. They, they have taken the world by the throat and they have shaken it <laughs> and they have made it what they want it to be. And what's this saying? Yes, yes, yes. Whatever glory A nation has is a which can be taken away, which can be taken away. Okay, okay, yes, yes. In the beginning, in the beginning, you might say, well, for the Assyrians, the gods did this for us. But in the end, it's, it's fascinating to me in Isaiah, in that the famous speech by the Rab Shachah, the third in charge of the army, he's speaking for Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, how can you think your God can save you? Look what I have done to all the gods of the nations. It's not even a contest between Ashur, the god of Assyria, and Yahweh, the god of Judah. No, it's a contest between Sennacherib, 
and Yahweh, and Sennacherib is going to take Yahweh down. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. You make one mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, Mel. I was going to ask how many years prior to this it was that when Jonah went and preached to them in the um, Yes, this is about 780. This is, of course, now a series gone. This is 585 or 588. So it's about 200 years later. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Uh, there's no mention of Jonah in any of the Assyrian materials. But it's just very fascinating that you've got very aggressive leaders up until about 780. And then you have a period of about 40 years, 35 actually, till... 745, when Assyria is very quiet. They're not moving. They're not conquering anything. It's often said, well, you got a couple of weak emperors. That's the problem. It coincides perfectly with Jonah's life. And then comes our good friend Tiglath Pileser III. <laughs> we had friends who named their cat that. <laughs> <laughs> and he then reverses it all. He is the aggressor par excellence. And he then initiates that last century of Assyrian conquest. But anyway, so again, it, it's so easy for us to forget this lesson, I think. Who is in charge of world history today? Our God is. Our God is. And the question is, are we, am I, Conducting my life in the light of that truth? Or am I forgetting and thinking that, like Assyria, I am an independent tree? I've got the waters around my feet. <laughs> the nations are in my shadow. I can handle it. Okay, now notice... If your Bible is set up this way, as the NIV is, 1 through 9 is set up as a poem. And then in verse 10, we go back to prose. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Why do you think we did that? Now again, as I've said many times before, I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> I've got some hunches, but what do you think? All right, all right. Poetry paints a picture and prose interprets the picture. Mm hmm, mm hmm. It shows the great contrast. The poem pictures Assyria how? Beautiful, powerful, standing tall. No, the severity of judgment is not beautiful. Exactly, exactly. I, and, and we've talked about this before, look at the pronouns. I gave it into the hands of the rulers of the nations. I cast it aside. And the most ruthless of foreign nations cut it down and left it. Its boughs fell on the, on the mountains and in all the valleys. Its branches lay broken in all the ravines of the land. I picture that army fleeing westward and leaving behind its baggage and everything else.
Verse 15, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day it was brought down to the realm of the dead, I covered the deep springs with mourning for it. I held back its streams. I clothed Le Lebanon with gloom. I made the nations tremble. Wow. So, Egypt, do you remember the fall of Assyria? Do you remember how mighty it was? And how in the end, it was you trying to prop it up? And so, do you think you're better than Assyria? Learn the lesson of history. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Uh, I, I, think, I think God might say to us, do you remember the British Empire? And you think that you're better than they are? Even as late as the First World War, we had a real inferiority complex about the British. And basically, the Britain bankrupted itself in the First World War, and <laughs> we survived the Depression, and uh, then we think we saved them. But I think the pattern is just the same, and I think, I think God is saying this to us today. You think you're better than they are? That glorious empire on which the sun never set? How easily we forget. Now, I want to talk about, obviously, the thing that is, is lurking in the background here is this issue of Pride. We've been talking about that throughout the study. And of course, in the catalog of the church, pride is the number one deadliest sin. Now why? All right, all right. What's the problem with that? <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. This sin says, I am God. I am the most important thing in the world. Now, what's the antidote to that? Well, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I don't matter. <laughs> really? Yeah. Why? Because it's a manipulation. Okay. Okay. Trying to make you feel sorry for me to give me what I want. It's another way of focusing attention on me. Oh, no, no, you have abilities. You can do certain things. Yeah, thank you. I knew that. <laughs> so, what is the answer? David? It is, it is, <coughs> it 
Now, how can that happen? Really now, seriously, how can that happen? I mean, we're all locked in here to ourselves. <laughs> Every one of us looks out at the world through these windows. So how can, can, can you really, can you really be self-forgetful? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. How does that happen? <laughs> Reorientation, yes. Okay, okay. You Yes, I think we could say as a synonym refocusing. Where's the focus of my attention? Now again, friends, I don't know about you, but this ain't easy. How am I looking? What are they thinking? How are they responding to what I'm doing or saying or being? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you yes. Forget yourself. yes, 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 yes. The devil doesn't care how he gets us to focus on ourselves. Am I a real Christian? <laughs> <laughs> it helps to remember too for me that Jesus said without me you can do nothing yes so nothing yes. that I'll do yes. without yes. his thumb yes. cover it's working yes. or it won't last yes 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 none of this is going to happen unless We walk in the Spirit. As a daily, as a daily life to allow His Spirit to correct, to direct, to inspire. And this He will refocus us. He will refocus us on the Father's will. He'll refocus us. But this is, this is in many ways the bottom line in the holy life. It's here that the battle has to be fought and won by the Spirit, and the other things will follow. But lose the battle here. All my righteousness is filthy rags, because it's mine. <laughs> so this, this battle throughout is that battle of pride. The nations stand up against God and say, I am going to have my way. I'm going to take over Judah's territory or I'm going to be the one 
that somehow saves Judah's neck? I'm the one that's going to do this. So, Ezekiel says to Egypt, the issue is not between you and the other nations. Which of the other trees of Eden are you going to compare yourself to? It's between you and me. <laughs> and so it is in our own lives. It's not what others are achieving, what others are accomplishing, what I can do better than they, etc. It's uh uh. You want to compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself to God. Oops. <laughs> Oops. So I have often said, if you plan to get to heaven on the basis of your righteousness, the only passing score is 100. 99 will not cut it. <laughs> and we say, well, that's not fair. Well, it depends on your imagery. What passing grade is there in the cancer ward? A hundred percent. If the if the surgeon comes out and you're in the uh, recovery room and he says, "Good news, we got ninety-five percent of it." Not good news. Bad news. Or if you're Neil Armstrong walking on the moon and your suit has ninety-nine percent integrity. <laughs> You're dead. So it is. Egypt, who are you going to compare yourself to? And again, think about the audacity of this. The only real comparison is Judah's God. No, wait. I mean, we've got Ray. We've got Horus. We've got Ammon Ray. We've got all these great gods who look like me. <laughs> and I'm supposed to compare myself to him? You talk about faith. That's faith. Our God. I've, I've said it several times. The God of Jesmond <laughs> County <laughs> is the God of the world. Wow. Wow. Okay. Unless you want to talk more about that, let's go on to uh, chapter 32. As I said in the background, there's a common understanding of reality in the ancient world. It takes different forms, but it's the same basic understanding. And it's the result of looking at the physical world and saying, well, what's reality like on the basis of this? So, what has always existed? Chaotic matter. And that chaotic matter takes a watery form. Now again, that's not at all far from modern physics. Matter has always existed. Infused with energy. Energy translates into matter, matter translates into energy. And it is essentially formless. We haven't gotten very far in 5,000 years of human civilization. So there it is. So this is monstrous. I'm sometimes interested, our, our 
I guess he is, our next to youngest grandchild, is fascinated with dinosaurs. I have a suspicion that that goes right back to Sumeria. <laughs> Monsters. <laughs> and so, out of this, by sexual means, come the gods. Now the Egyptian story is a little different from the Mesopotamian story, but it's essentially the same idea. In the beginning was chaos. Chaotic matter. This stuff has always existed. Whoops, careful. This stuff has always existed. But it doesn't take much thinking to realize that this stuff resists order. It doesn't like order. Now, that's a way of talking about the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> Everything tends to inertia. <laughs> Everything tends to disintegrate. Put a stack of cards in the field, all mixed up. How long will it take for nature to put them in order from one to... F Never. Never. Put them in order, and how long will it take nature to mess them up? <laughs> About two hours. <laughs> so, so, the gods then seek to impose order. And that takes war. <laughs> I always think that's kind of funny. War imposes order? <laughs> no, war imposes disorder. But there it is. So that's in the background. That's how ancient Near Eastern people think about reality. <coughs> Chaos, yes. Is order really um, control? Well, in order to get order, you've got to have control. You, you've got to, again, look at the world. You have to force order on people. If you have any children, you know that. They're not going to clean up their room normally unless they're strange. <laughs> their room is going to be a mess unless mom and dad forcefully impose order on this situation. That's the world. And, and chaos is always at the door. I, I've never forgotten, 1973, some of you weren't born then, but the first oil crisis. And the truckers went on strike. And I've never forgotten a truck driver saying, I never realized how easy it is to shut down a whole civilization. It's keeping it going that is the problem. Shutting it down is easy. OK, all that to say that's what's going on in 32. You're like a monster in the seas, thrashing about in your streams, churning the water with your feet, muddying the streams. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, with a great throng of people. Hmm. Humans? Hmm. In that view, humans are an afterthought. In the biblical understanding, humans are the apex of it all. We're what it's about. 
With a great throng of people, I'll cast my net over you, and they will haul you up in my net. I'll throw you on the land and hurl you on the open field. I'll let all the birds of the sky settle on you. All the animals of the wild will gorge themselves on you. I'll spread your flesh on the mountains, fill the valleys with your remains. I'll drench the land with your flowing blood all the way to the mountains, and the ravines will be filled with your flesh. When I snuff you out, I'll cover the heavens and darken the stars. I'll cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I'll darken over you. I'll bring darkness over your land, recalls, declares the sovereign Lord. Now what he's doing is he's picturing Egypt as that chaos monster. That's not to say that Ezekiel believes in that view of reality, but he's using this language that is familiar to everybody to make his point. God, and interestingly, God is not imposing order. He's imposing disorder. Hmm, hmm, hmm. What you so carefully built up with your human power, I can scatter in a moment. Verse 10, I'll cause many peoples to be appalled at you. Their kings will shudder with horror because of you when I brandish my sword before them. On the day of your downfall, each of them will tremble every moment for his life. So again, we're talking about the dominant power of Yahweh. It's his Number one, his supreme power in the universe. Number two, it is his power to destroy human order. Wow. We have so, so carefully put it all together. We've built our sand castles. And God comes along and boom. So, it's in that light then that he has the power to save. You have constructed an order built on human pride, and the result of that is oppression of my people. I'm able to break that structure and impose true order. not just putting chaotic matter together for a little while. No, I can give and shalom is wholeness. That's what Jesus means when he says, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. All the world can give is this sort of thing. Human order imposed for a while. No, Jesus can put us together. So implicit in this poem in which God takes the chaos monster apart, <laughs> but in fact takes apart the order that the chaos monster has imposed on the world 
and produces the new order. So, in verses 16 through 31, and it sort of fits into this study titled Death and Resurrection, the last section of chapter 32 is about death. This is the lament they will chant for her, for Egypt. The daughters of the nations will chant it for Egypt, and all her hordes they'll chant it, declares the Lord Yahweh. In the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the month, that is, the siege is over, Jerusalem has fallen, Egypt's help was useless. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, wail for the hordes of Egypt. Consigned to the earth below, both her and the daughters of mighty nations, along with those who go down to the pit. Now there's a lot of discussion about what is the Old Testament's view of the afterlife. And the simple answer is, we're not sure. There is this word, and basically when you see pit or grave in your English translation, it is translating the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol is, for want of a better word, the underworld. It is a, a gray, dusty place where nobody in their right mind wants to go. And it's, it's what you find in the Psalms. God, you don't want to let me die because nobody praises you in Sheol. <laughs> I love the Psalms. <laughs> Why? Why do you have to wait for the New Testament to get heaven and hell? And I remind you, we get both of them from the New Testament, not the Old. The answer is because in the pagan view, this world is the shadow. And the other world is reality. Mm -hmm. So you think you've got choices. You don't. All your choices are faded by what's going on in the other world. This is why I don't like Frank Peretti, frankly. <laughs> the Old Testament says, don't you believe it. This world is real. And you have real choices to make here that have consequences. Your choices are not fated. So they're trying to drive that point home. You got it? This is a real world. Got it? Yeah, I think we got it. Okay, let me tell you, there is more to reality. <clears throat> but you got to get this point first. Got to get this one first. Now, the idea, is there life after death? Oh, yes. No question about that. But we're not interested in that right now. <laughs> so that what you see here is the picture of these nations going down to this place. And it's sometimes translated the grave, sometimes the pit.
And I think we can say death, which is not merely the end of everything. It's death as an ongoing reality. And again, I think that's intentional. I think the Old Testament is getting us ready. And this then is what the Bible would call the second death. The first death, the first death is your body stops living. Okay. The second death is the question of living forever for yourself and apart from God. Oh, and that's death. That's death. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now look. Who is there? Verse 22. Well, 18 through 20, 18 through 21 is Egypt. Who's there in 22? Assyria. Who's there in 24? Elam. Elam is Persia. Who's there in 26? Meshech and Tubal. Um, that's Armenia. Pharaoh is there. 29. Edom is there. Who's there in 30? The princes of the north and all the Sidonians. Mm -hmm. The Phoenicians. So, what are we saying then in this statement? I gave you the thought in the sixth question. Death is the great leveler. What's your reflection on that? There is no pomp. Yeah. No. No. All of that. You think back to that picture of Assyria in 31. And what do you got here? Nothing. Nothing. There's no pomp in death. Yes. What else? Can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. <laughs> yes. 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 What else? Your current state doesn't dictate your future state. As in, like, those kingdoms with all this wealth and power, you thought, oh, we can survive. Okay. 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 Your achievements, you yeah. cannot take your achievements with you. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody, the whole Near Eastern world is here. All of them. From Assyria, world empire, to Edom, nasty neighbor. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that Hitler died? Isn't it wonderful that Joseph Stalin died? In Isaiah 14, the world breathes a big sigh of relief when the Assyrian emperor goes down to hell. <laughs> Whoo! <laughs> He's gone. He's gone. So that in one sense, death is a good thing. It limits the rule of evil. And it does so, as we've been saying, by dis the destruction 
of creaturely pride. There is no pride in the undertakers. <laughs> As I grow older, I, I think more about this. I look at all the stuff I have acquired in all these years of living and think our poor children. <laughs> They're going to have to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> poor people. <laughs> but yes. So in one sense, we tend to look upon death as, oh, terrible. But, in another sense, <coughs> Francis of Assisi called death our friend. Yes, yes. Brother death, he called it. <laughs> and the reason I think that death holds such terror for us is precisely because it's infected with this. It's not merely <clears throat> transference. <laughs> which I think was what it was intended to be originally. Somehow, Adam and Eve had to have been transferred from this purely physical life to the spiritually physical life. And that transfer would not have been something to dread. It'd be something to look forward to. So I think of what <clears throat> David Seaman said once. I'm not afraid of death. It's just dying that worries me. <laughs> how, how did you say that you felt that death is somehow infected? I think that death. Which, which would explain just having a, a really wonderful Christian man just this week say to me, I just fear because I have no one in my family who would care for me. So the fear of being unloved and alone yes. is infected with that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. If it hadn't been for the fall, the moment of the end of this life and transfer into the next would have had no terror for us. But because of sin, it's become infected. So, we've died. <laughs> we've come to the end of this part of the book. And in the fall, we'll start on resurrection. <laughs> when... <laughs> yep. Life, exactly, yeah. Yeah, Ben makes a good point. In the fall, when everything is dying, we'll talk about life. Thank you all. Have a great summer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you are the sovereign of the universe. Thank you that being sovereign, you are good. And that your goodness is seen in your hesed. Your unending, unchanging, undying love for each of your children. Thank you that you have proven yourself true across the centuries, true to your word, true to your people. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come 
to make the Father's goodness and grace and mercy and truth and hesed available to each of us. In your face, we see the face of God. Thank you. Praise you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you make it possible that we should experience the very life of God, that we should be able to rise above the terrifying loneliness of pride and be able in falling, falling at your feet, to rise to all eternity. Praise you. In your name, amen.